Guard with Convergence Digital Transformations Team. Thank you for joining me as we discuss how to create safer spaces with weapon and gunshot detection solutions. The objective of this session is to brief you on how to detect weapons further out of the perimeter, rapidly detect an active shooter event, notify the right people instantly, and automate SOP and response plans. Before we get started, I wanna let you know that everyone has been muted. So if you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A tab on the right. I'm not gonna take the full amount of time allocated for this presentation. So we'll have plenty of time to discuss your questions. And I will give my contact info at the end of this presentation if you'd like to reach me directly. So let's get started. Weapons detection is a fairly broad category and the purpose of implementing a weapons detection solution or part of a strategy isn't to detect weapons necessarily, but to prevent mass casualty events by detecting the weapons that are used in the mass casualty events and to do so as early as possible. And that's an important distinction because there are a number of weapons detection solutions on the market that will alarm on a weapon, but they aren't integrated with any other system and they don't actually provide adequate response times. So I'm focusing the discussion on mass casualty weapons, which will include rifles, shotguns, handguns, and explosives. Those are the weapons that have the greatest impact to your staff, your customers, and operations. I'm excluding knives, bats, and other smaller weapons because those are really best dedicated or really best detected with walk-through metal detectors. And most organizations just don't have the manpower to enforce such screening efforts. Another aspect of weapons detection is the ability to extend the facility's perimeter out as far out as possible to create as much space and time between the bad actor and the response strategies. The farther out you can detect a weapon, the more time you have to respond or lock down. I have to give a couple disclaimers at this point that no solution is perfect. There is no one size fits all solution. So multiple layers should be evaluated and implemented depending on your use cases. I'm also going to sidestep any discussion about whether employees, customers, delivery people, contractors, et cetera, are legally or procedurally allowed to bring weapons onto company property and instead focus only on the technologies that can detect weapons, whether or not they're supposed to be there. With that, I want to start with a timeline of a mass casualty event. And here we have a red pin on a line. The red represents the mass casualty event with the actions that come before the event on the left and the actions that come to the or after the event on the right. Next, we'll place the security functions along that timeline. I'm using NIST's framework, but there are other frameworks. And these steps are simply to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. I want to point out that the first three are before the event occurs. Those are left of boom. And this is where weapons detection is uniquely positioned. Next, we'll overlay the time and cost axes, where the time axis ranks the five functions against the time it takes to implement each component, and the cost axis ranks the five functions against the potential impact to the organization. We'll go over these five functions in more detail in the next slides, but the premise is that the simple step of conducting a risk analysis in the identification stage takes very little time and money as compared to what is required to recover from a mass casualty event in terms of loss of life, damage to a facility, impact to brand and reputation, employee customer trust, lawsuits, and other factors. Next, we're going to look at the tactics and technologies that make up each of the five steps. And this is where we get into the specifics of the people, the processes, and technologies that support weapons detection. So here I have the five, the five steps of the framework set in a layered format with the mass casualty event we're trying to prevent in between layers three and four. Starting with identify, the tactics of this stage involve analysis to proactively identify the risk to the staff and the customers at each facility and the policies to increase information sharing between departments. First, you need to start with an updated risk assessment to understand the potential threats the facility may face. Workspaces have changed considerably this year and last year, and everyone should be updating their risk assessments anyway. Next, you need to have policies in place about how potential threats are communicated internally. HR should notify security and operations about terminated employees. Supervisors should notify security when threats are made and so on. For the technologies involved in this phase, we have risk monitoring. These solutions proactively monitor, identify, analyze, and alert on threats against your people and your organization. And risk monitoring scours thousands of data sources worldwide in real time to detect events and incidents 
that pose a threat and then presents those threats as alerts in your security operations center. I'm making an assumption with weapons detection that you have a security operations center in place and that the weapons detection solution will be integrated into some form of a unified security platform with your video surveillance, access control, mass notification, and other systems for complete and instant situational awareness. This unified security platform is a tool that enables the integration of all security, safety, and operational applications into a single interface and can be as big as a PSIM or a physical security information management platform or as small as a video management system that has the ability to integrate other systems. As we move into the protect phase, these are the tactics that make it harder for a bad guy to get into the facility and walk around the facility. What can be done to harden the facility's perimeter and then the entrance? How strong are the access control policies at the entrance and the elevators? Are contractors issued badges that are active for longer than their contract duration? For technologies, I'm assuming there's an access control in place and it's able to be updated instantly to disable badges for terminated employees and maintain properly. Another solution is facial recognition. Facial recognition may not be authorized at your facility, um, but it, it can be a very effective tool to detect people on bolo lists and black lists at the entrances. The next stage is the detection stage. And this is where we uh, attempt to increase the distance between the detection and the event, and we wanna decrease the response time. We're gonna break the detection technologies into two categories, the detection of a weapon and the detection of the mass casualty event itself. So as we look at these weapons detections use cases, there are several physical layers where a weapon can be detected depending on the technology being used. At the perimeter, the farthest detection I'm aware of is about 30 meters from the sensor. These solutions use millimeter wave radar, video content analysis, LIDAR, and other technologies to detect weapons concealed on a person or in their bags up to that distance, which gives you the ability to detect a weapon before the person gets near the front door so that you can go into lockdown or address the threat with personnel adequately. The other advantage of these solutions is the sheer volume of subjects that can be scanned with no impact to the way they navigate your facilities. They do require line of sight from the sensor to the subject, but the detection distance enables tremendous flexibility in where and how high up these sensors can be installed. The next perimeter layer relies on video analytics on your existing cameras to detect a brandished weapon. These are effective up to 10 meters from the camera and the cam camera can be placed anywhere. These are really interesting solutions since research, according to the manufacturers, indicates about 80% of mass shootings involved a weapon being brandished prior to entering the facility. Again, these solutions enable a high screening volume with no impact to pedestrian traffic flows, and they, but they also do require clear line of sight from the camera to the subject. The next detection layer is at the entrance itself, and this relies on portals that people walk through. They use millimeter wave radar to detect concealed weapons on the person or in their bags, not metal detection, so subjects can maintain their walking pace and don't require people to divest of their phones or pocket litter. And then even if they make it inside the facility because there were no detection solutions in place at the entrance, then the same video analytics that can detect a brandished weapon on the exterior can also be applied to existing interior cameras. For the technologies that detect a mass casualty event itself, these are the solutions that detect the gunshot or the behaviors associated with an active shooter. Gunshot detection can be applied indoors and outdoors and the sensors differ in their use of audio, energy waveform or muzzle flash to identify a firearm has been discharged. They can allocate, they can locate gunshots on a floor plan in relation to the sensor location and then automatically transmit alerts to mass notification systems and first responders. There are also video analytics that can detect abnormal behaviors indicative of a mass casualty event, such as fighting, people lying on the floor, crowds running, crowds moving in the wrong direction, et cetera. And then as we move after the incident to the response phase, at this phase, it's critical to have deployed or developed your standard operating procedures beforehand. After an event occurs, communications will be overwhelmed, information will be conflicting, people will fall back to their level of training. So SOPs have to be in place and practice frequently. You're gonna to have to answer hard questions of your facility and your personnel. 
Will security personnel confront a person with concealed weapons? How will they confront the person? Are they armed? Will the SOC know what's going on at the entrance? Do they have the ability to view the cameras remotely? What are the communications channels? How will they alert and instruct people in, still inside the building? How will law enforcement be informed? These are just some of the questions you have to ask. And then the technologies that facilitate all those SOPs fall into mass notification, which enables the SOC to instantly notify designated contacts with geocentric alerts and instructions across any communications platform, whether that's cell phones, text, email, laptop, screen takeovers, digital signage. And then gunshot detection solutions should be configured to automatically alert law enforcement of gunfire. Real-time location sensing is another tool to instantly determine where everyone is in the facility in response to an incident, and then broadcast alerts and instructions and even enable lockdown procedures or enable mustering. And then the different detection solutions can be integrated or they all should be integrated with your access control to enable automated lockdown procedures or opening up doors, depending on the location and type of the incident. In the recover phase, obviously the first step is to take care of your employees. Law enforcement will want all video and data surrounding the event. In addition though, the event should be an opportunity to assess how your security protocols are measured up in the form of an after action report. Those AARs determine what SOPs need adjustment and what additional technologies are required in the future. So hopefully you see the value in adopting weapons detection capabilities. And if so, and you'd like to partner with Convergent to take the next step, then we engage in a roadmap process. And this is a five-step process, which can, um, can go as fast as you want it to, depending on your requirements and initiatives. But these five steps involve requirements gathering, where we work with your one, two, and three tier stakeholders to capture all of your current procedures, the known gaps, where you want to be in one, three, and five years. We then come back with an assessments and recommendations document where we benchmark you against your peers across different industries to help you understand where you are deficient, where you need a little more work, where technologies can add to your operations. You have the ability to then review that and we come together in an alignment and priorities phase where you tell us where we got it right, where the assessment recommendation document needs a little improvement. And then we develop the priorities jointly where you tell us this is what you need to see on day one, um, maybe after six months of deployment. And then by the end of five years, these are all the capabilities you want. At that point and not until that point, we bring in specific technology partners to give demos on the solutions. And rather than a full demo talking about their customers or their, their company information, we really focus those demonstrations on the use cases identified in the assessments and recommendations phase so that you can see how the solution is going to work in your environment. And then in the conceptual design and statement of work as an out, outcome of that solutions demo, when one or two technology platforms are identified as having the right capabilities, we then provide the entire cost, the total cost of ownership for people processes in addition to the technologies for the one, three and five year milestones. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, again, please submit them in the Q&A tab on the right. There's a 15 second delay between when I talk and when you're gonna hear this. So I'm gonna give it a little second or give it a little time to for you to submit questions. Um, I'm also gonna put my contact info up here if you'd like to reach me after this. So I see we have some questions coming in. Um, yes, if you email me, I can send you this presentation. Um, and uh, I don't know how they are going to present the recording to the attendees later on, but uh, I assume you'll get an email on that. Um, Someone stated, it's interesting with all the concealed carry options and how quick a threat can escalate, your system is able to detect them. Um, yes, so weapons can be detected that are concealed under clothing, in bags. Um, again, the millimeter wave radar detection solutions are very capable of doing this and the subjects uh, can pass through fairly wide portals. They don't have to slow down. They don't have to divest. The way that the millimeter wave solutions work is that the uh, subjects pass through and unlike a metal detector, which requires that the subjects stop, stand in line, divest of everything in their pockets, walk through the scanner, put their bags on scanners. 
with these millimeter wave portals, subjects are just able to walk through on their phones with their keys in their pocket, keys in their bag, everything else. And then if the artificial intelligence that's on these devices, which is able to separate the nuisance items from the weapons, if that determines that there is a weapon or a suspected weapon, then that person is identified as requiring additional screening. Any other questions? Okay, that looks like the extent of the questions. So I'm gonna give you a good part of your day back, but thank you very much for joining me in this session. Again, if you have any questions,